UFO Encounters in the Woods by Gerardus. It is rather funny that I just found out about your show, considering I'm a real-life swamp dweller myself. I live in a hamlet that's smaller than a village named Swamp in an actual swamp. My house is on the far outskirts of it, all alone in the middle of the woods with a bubbling creek running around the house and two sloping hills on either side. I call myself the real life Shrek, but on to the story. This happened at this house around 25 years ago when I was around 10. Back then, the house was a holiday house, a refurnished water mill that had been in the family for over 200 years. The time the story takes place, or at least the first part of it anyway, was summertime. And during that childhood time off, it was a course summer break. Even the parents took vacation days so we could all enjoy our time together. And it wasn't just us, but also a friend of mine at the time, and his mother was also there. We played, ran in the woods and the swamp together, explored, and so on. But the event in the story happened on the third day. It was right after lunchtime, or so I was surprised, when all of the adults started displaying extreme lethargy. And even I, rather sleepy and tired for some reason out of nowhere, which was never the case, said that we should all take an afternoon nap, and everybody else agreed. It was strange, since we all talked about how busy we wanted to stay that day, when I noticed that a friend of mine, who will stay unnamed, didn't look sleepy or lethargic at all. So. I wanted to see what was going on with them. I honestly felt bad about leaving him awake alone, but my head hit the pillow pretty hard and I was about to fall asleep. But that's when I noticed something and I forced myself to stand up again and go down the stairs towards the exit. When I went to the outside, it seemed like it was too bright even for the middle of the day. I stepped on the veranda and saw my friend walking toward me annoyedly. I didn't know what was happening or why he looked annoyed, but something told me to look up. There was some voices in my head, so I did. I saw straight up high in the sky, too high it was beyond the clouds. Around these clouds was a cigar shaped thing. I thought it was a UFO, and uh, I was looking at it in broad daylight. I thought it could be a plane for just a moment, but it had no wings and was hovering completely still. In shock, I looked at my friend and yelled, Look up! Do you see that? He looked up, but his expression remained the same. And as we both looked, the craft started moving forward, slowly, at this, speeding up, faster and faster, until it zipped away so quickly I couldn't believe it, like one of those science fiction movies. I swiftly ran into the house and tried to wake up my mom and tell her what we saw. But, well, no one would believe two kids that they just saw a UFO, especially if one of them wasn't even trying to sound convincing. And that was it for a very, very long time. I tried explaining the story off as some weird hallucination, but after some time I gave up. Many years later, I stopped being with that friend and meeting with them, and I had a strange revelation. I suddenly remembered all the events all over again, but this time some very scary and questionable details emerged. First of all, the moment I looked through the exit, I saw the very bright light. I saw my friend at the end of the grass clearing by the creek. He seemed so distant, and by him standing was two weird figures. One was tall, about six feet tall, and the other was only about three feet tall. They were talking when the tall one noticed me staring at them, and then the two looked very upset at the friend when he turned towards me and started walking while the other two vanished in the yellow whitest flash beaming skywards. And that's where my previous memory resumed only knowing I had to look skyward to see the UFO flying off. After this revelation, a few more things started clicking in my mind, such as why the patch of ground where those two stood over had a discolored patch of grass for nearly two decades, why that friend never again returned to the house, why everyone was supposed to be passed out for whatever reason, for whatever they were doing, and how I somehow interrupted them. But why didn't they get in the house, or why during the day? Why did they stay so far away from the house? Later I learned from my grandmother that the valley the house was built on used to be a refuge for people hiding from raids and that there were plenty of shrines and the like around. Also, 
a self-proclaimed witch visited the place, calling it a leyline nexus and a safe place from evil. But I'm not so sure how much you can believe in that stuff. It's definitely a strange and crazy memory that I'll forever remember. This story could have been more spooky, sensational, long, and interesting. But, in my experience, it was something that changed my life forever. Small Town Murder by OK Category In May 2022, I worked at a gas station and truck stop in a small town outside of Houston in Dallas. For most of my time working there, I was a night shift employee from 3 to 11 p.m. To make this short, let me add a little background on the business and some minor details about the town I was in. The town is rather small and rural. The closest shopping center is quite a few hours away, and one of the only grocery stores in town is Dollar General. The store I worked at was right next to an interstate that went throughout Texas, so we got a lot of customers, especially on weekends. We typically saw a lot of truckers, churchgoers, and people traveling with their little league teams. Now that the basics are covered, I can tell you about the events that took place that May. On May 12th, around 1.50 p.m., I got ready for work. It was a typical day, thus far until I got an emergency alert stating, Escaped Armed Convict Mail. This was strange, considering the nearest prison to me was an all-female prison and was more than 45 minutes away. Despite the alert, everyone was still required to attend their shift. Three o'clock rolls around and we're all standing around the break room waiting to clock in. I remember everyone being super on edge, people whispering about the Amber Alert trying to get more details about what was happening. Nonetheless, we got to work. Typically we get two breaks that were about 15 minutes each, equating to 30 minutes in total. This was awful but we made do. This isn't really important but it does add context. We were not allowed to go outside for our breaks due to the alert and for our safety. The night shift crew was hands down the best group of people to work with, but on the first night of the unpleasant week, it was not the A-team. Once we clocked in, it was like there was a floodgate that opened for all the police and TDCJ, Texas Department of Criminal Justice officers, to come in. We had hundreds and hundreds of people coming in for some barbecue sandwiches and simple pizzas. And one of my favorite co-workers was the front end of it all. She was helping people left and right while making sure she was doing her shift leading duties. I ran back and forth from the jerky case to the deli case, trying to get as many people out as possible. It was a very crazy night. Everyone searching for this convict was passing through our store, just trying to get nourishment for the long night ahead. That night, my co-worker and I only got a break, each after helping what felt like a thousand officers, but it was not in vain. We did end up getting some information from the people on the search. Things like what this man looked like and what he was going to prison for. There were possible ideas of where this guy was heading and they thought it was towards San Antonio, about an hour away from where we were. Now, I need some more background on the town I was in. Like I said before, the town was very rural. There were farms and ranches everywhere and tons of wooded areas. Also to mention again, we were right on an interstate, so there were plenty of places to hide and run. I will spare you all the boring details of my week and get into the horrifying part. The search for this waste of life lasted three whole weeks. On June 2nd, he broke into a ranch house only a few miles from town. While in there, he managed to find a razor, shave his head, and cleaned up his face. He ate the food that the family had left. It's unknown how long he was in the house or if he had been wandering around and just found this empty one. Well, that day, a family of five walked into the ranch and found this piece of scum in there. The convict murdered this family. A grandfather and his four grandsons were brutally murdered. He shot them and then robbed them of the grandfather's truck and some guns. A relative hadn't heard anything from the family in a couple of hours and knew of the situation that was going on in this town. They called the police, and when they found the bodies, there was a national alert that went off telling everyone to be on the lookout for a white truck. 
this was difficult for every officer because there were so many surrounding towns and they couldn't even know what direction or how long ago this person had left. I don't know how they did it or what efforts they exhausted, but they managed to find the truck and set out spike strips to pop the wheels. The convict got out of the vehicle and started shooting at the police who returned shots. Eventually their shots landed and the man was declared dead. Three weeks of torment for everyone in my town was finally over. This guy managed to kill five innocent people, children. This man killed children. In Texas, we have the death penalty, and I genuinely believe he got what he deserved. My mom told me once that it was over. There was a photo of his body on the internet, and to this day it's still on Twitter. I look at that photo sometimes, and honestly, I feel like the trapped air in my lungs came out at the same time. This idiot was dead. Followed down dark, rural roads by Natural Edged. This happened about a year ago and remained in the top three of the scariest moments of my life. I was living in a rural county town in the mountains. It was so rural that there was only one road to take you in and out of the city. About 50 miles of pitch black cliffs, fields, and the occasional farm. At the beginning of this road, when you first leave the big city, a vast gas station is always packed. This will be important. My mom and I had seen the midnight showing of some movie and were heading home. We often stopped at the gas station to get a drink and fill up on gas for the long ride home. As we were leaving, I vaguely noticed a dingy green jeep pull out behind us, but I put this out of my mind. People came and went from businesses all the time. The jeep drove behind us for about 5-10 minutes, keeping a reasonable distance. Again, it's really not that weird, but suddenly the car comes flying past us and down the way. My mom, who is driving, just scoffs and rolls her eyes. We were driving a comfortable 50 miles per hour, but those who knew the roads well would often go over 100 even at night, and zoom past anyone going slower. Our annoyance at the unsafe driving quickly turns into anxiety. The jeep is pulled over on the side of the road with its hazards on. The back half of this car is partially in the road. What? And there's some, some sort of man's arm sticking out of the driver's side window, gesturing for us to pull over. My mom doesn't slow down, it just goes around him. We are both on edge but it only intensifies as he flies past us again, pulls over and gestures for us to pull over. He does this once more before things get genuinely terrifying. After we pass him the third time, he tailgates us at least 60 miles per hour. He's so close that his headlights aren't even visible in the rearview mirror, only the vague shape of his silhouette behind the windshield. He blares on his horn every few seconds, sticking his arm out the window to wave at us. This carries on for a half an hour. My mom is starting to hyperventilate, constantly increasing in speed as she tries to escape. I'm sobbing and clutching a pocket knife to make myself feel somewhat better, more than anything. And even though I'm not proud of it, I'm screaming at her, Don't you dare pull over! If you've ever seen the movie Rest Stop, that was all that was going through my mind. I can only picture us getting murdered or worse on the side of a dark, lonely road in the middle of nowhere. There's no service until you hit town and that we couldn't call police or anyone for quite some time. But just as I'm about to throw up from the nerves, the man slams on his brakes, turns around, and returns the way he came. We went the rest of the way home in silence. My mom and I talked about it for quite a long time the next day, and we figured he had seen us, two lone women, driving down a dark road and thought we would be easy pickings, and he would have been right. Some people I've told this story to suggest that we dropped cash or receipt at the gas station and they were just trying to be a good Samaritan and return it to us. But let's be real, I highly doubt that. Nobody's trying to chase us down at 1am on a dark country road. Nobody who does that has good intentions. Nobody's going that hard to give you a receipt or some sort of cash you dropped. Here's the weird thing. A few weeks later, the same jeep did the same thing to a group of men carpooling to work at 7 a.m. If he's going to do these strange activity with four men during the daybreak, it makes me wonder what his intentions are. Fall 
first off, I would like to start by saying that I am not a professional writer by any means, but have always been attracted by everything paranormal. I was not always the bravest person as a kid, but I liked it all even still. I have experienced many things throughout my life, some things that seem like they are from a movie or a book. This time I will be telling you of a more mild and a little less strange thing that happened to me while walking home one night. Before I start, I will give you a little bit of background, so you better understand my story. I was born and raised in a small town in Mexico. Everyone knew everyone, and even though we had cars, we had all mostly walked everywhere. There was crime, but it was exceedingly rare, and nothing violent really ever happened. I am the youngest of five, and my parents were rarely ever home. This meant I was able to stay up late and go pretty much anywhere I wanted. My hometown is in sort of a valley, with most of the town on one side of the tallest hills. My house was on a block right on the foothills of the steepest hill of my street, directly perpendicular to the two main streets leading up to it. One of these streets was essentially a main road. It was used to go up to a hill which was used for religious traditions. Anyway, this main road was mostly populated by family with my grandmother on my mom's side of the family living near the middle of the hill. Her house itself was small, but the plot was big and had my aunt's houses scattered around it. This was still quite a long walk from my street, probably five minutes of walking. My family was a very typical Mexican family, and would gather at her house pretty much every single night. On one night, I ended up staying way past my usual time with a few cousins. By the time I started heading home, it was well past midnight. There were street lights, but they were very spaced out along the street, which was blocked off by a bunch of trees, making my area very dark. It was creepy, especially for a kid, but the moon was out and it helped ease my nerves just a bit. I began walking downhill toward my house the entire time, I just kept feeling weird, like I was being followed. I did not necessarily feel like I was in danger, I guess, but I felt very uneasy. The entire walk, my heart felt like it was going to jump into my throat. I kept walking down the street, having to look back and around every so often. Eventually, I reached the corner, turned toward my house, and now I was on my street. There has been a house that has been abandoned for an exceptionally long time. It has always given me the creeps, and it was the third house from the corner. I was just about to walk by it. Every time I walked by, I would always walk on the opposite side of the street, which did not even have a sidewalk. I would have walked through that same path that night, but this time it was blocked off by these huge piles of sand and dirt, probably some kind of construction work nearby. That, combined with a huge delivery truck parked on the curb belonging to my neighbors, forced me to walk in the middle of the street. As I approached the house, I had to mentally prepare and give myself the courage to walk in front of it. My heart began racing. I was always scared of the house, but for some reason, that night just seemed so much worse somehow. I forced myself to keep walking, and as I did, I heard someone call me from the direction of the house. I froze. My heart in my mouth, and turned to look, but I did not see anyone or anything. I felt a huge wave of relief wash over me. I began breathing again, and I had been apparently holding my breath. I was about to start walking again when I heard the voice again this time. I turned to look at a boy. He looked to be about my age at the time, maybe a little bit younger. It struck me as odd more than anything to see a kid my age standing right next to me. I did not even think twice about the fact that I could see him perfectly even though he was standing in the dark. No lights coming from an abandoned house, and even a tree blocking the moon and street light. He kept standing there unmoving for a few more moments, not saying a word, just kind of staring at me. The whole time I was trying to process what was going on. He spoke again, asking me to go with him, saying we would play together. I kept trying to speak, but could not seem to form words. It felt like hours went by. The whole time I was frozen in place, just staring at this kid, my racing mind, 
and now realized he seemed to be glowing. I began to tremble the entire time. I kept trying to move to scream, but I, I just couldn't. I couldn't even move to, to run. I wanted to get away desperately. That kid stood there staring back at me, not moving, not blinking. He spoke one more time before walking a few steps closer to me. He seemed to pass like a shadow or something as he walked. His figure turned dark and then became bright again. As this happened, he called my name. My full name. And then I realized he looked like me somehow. Th th this, sh this shook to my core. I jerked back at the sight of this. It was me, but the eyes were all wrong. They looked like they were full of hatred. I, I regained control of myself. I screamed no at whatever this thing was and ran faster than I ever have before in my entire life. I still have no idea what that thing was. It didn't seem to follow me, and I never saw it again after that. It still scares me to think back to that day. People ask all the time here to try to figure out what it is that they saw, but I honestly kind of don't want to know. Anyway, if you do decide to read this on your channel, thank you so much for your time. So I live in a small town inland of the coast of New South Wales. I say in a town, but the house is situated a few kilometers out of the town. It is the kind of area you can see your neighbors in the distance, but you would really have to be screaming bloody murder for anyone to really hear you. A few more kilometers up the road, and it turns to the solid bush in National Park. It is an old dirt road with trees on either side. Quiet, apart from a few dirt bike riders who go there mostly on weekends and the occasional lost car full-wheel drive, or person collecting wood. So for me, it was the perfect place to walk my dogs. On the day in question, I was out with my two dogs, a Great Dane and a Husky, and my mom's dog, a Scotty Terrier. My Husky likes to misbehave, so to stop her from taking off into the bush at the smell of a kangaroo, she is on an extender leash. My Dane is loyal to the core, so he is off-leash, and so is the Scotty. She can be a pain and run off, but usually comes back. So this bush road has what it is called fire roads. I believe they were put there as an escape route, just in case if people get stuck in bush fires. But I'm not entirely sure. These little beat up paths are 20 times tougher than the already rough dirt road I walk along. I was heading back towards home at this stage when suddenly all the dogs freeze up. For a moment, I thought it must have been a kangaroo or a wallaby, and instinctively grabbed my husky's leash tighter. She always pulled my arm off when she saw or smelt a kangaroo, but they all stood frozen. I could see the fur on my Dane's back standing on end as they stared ahead towards the fire trail that branched off. For a moment, I thought it must have been a person and they were on edge because they had not expected to see someone. But as I took the time to look at what the three of them were staring at, I finally saw it. A brown colored shadow in the thinner area of trees before the dirt track about 15 meters away. Now I walked this road nearly daily, so I knew each damn log in this area, and it was not something I had seen before. This was confirmed when the thing suddenly shot off and moved. It was fast. Like, abnormally fast. The kind of speed you would expect for someone on a motorbike. But there was no motor. In fact, despite my straining ears, I could not hear a sound. No cracking of sticks. No rustling of branches. It just took off into the thicker trees after standing there and watching me for a good ten seconds or so. I was sure I had to be going mad, but as I looked at the dogs, all their heads were turned staring in the same direction this thing had vanished. It took me another 30 seconds, standing, listening before I finally managed to move forward towards the spot this thing had been. I had to pass it to get home. As I walked past it, the dogs all acted very strange. My normally brave husky would not go near the spot, kind of sniffing at it from a distance then pulling ahead. The Dane did a full circle of the spot going to the furthest point on the other side of the road 
to avoid it. His tail was tucked between his legs, and the Scotty followed him, cowering in a shadow. I had never seen them act like this before. Normally, if there was an animal or a scent, they would all barge each other to sniff it, but they wanted nothing to do with this spot. If it were a person, my dame would normally go into defense mode and stand guard, so I do not think that is what this was. Walking in this area so often, I knew the sounds of kangaroos, wallabies, birds, snakes, even feral deer. But this thing? It moved like it did not touch the ground. Not a sound. Had the dogs not been there, and reacted at the same time, I would have thought I was just imagining it or I was insane. But the silence of the bush after, it made me feel not so right. The whole way back I just felt like I was being watched. I kept looking back over my shoulder, but I kept seeing and hearing nothing. As I left the bushy area, I began to feel more at ease and the dogs began to relax. Honestly, I don't know what I saw that day. There isn't much on Australian paranormal stuff except for yaoi's and spirits, but this figure was too big for a person. It seemed wide and solid, more like that of a bear on its hind legs. It had a full build, and it seemed very tall. But clearly, there aren't any bears or any animals like that in Australia. So, what did I see? What did my dog see? It must have really spooked them, because I have never seen them act that way, and they have never acted that way again. Then again, I have made sure I have walked with more people more often. While I felt uncomfortable and nervous, I do not know if I was in danger or whatever it was. I mean, it did not attack me, though I felt like it followed me for a while. Either way, I certainly would not ever be going there without my dogs. About three years ago, I lived in a small Indiana town. Even as a kid, I always wanted to live there. It is the perfect town. Not too big, but everything is within a few minutes drive. Groceries, bowling, movies, and bars. The house I rented at the time was on a quiet street that sat at the very bottom of a valley. I never really knew anyone around me other than the neighbors that lived just north of me. After a couple of years of living there, I was sitting on my roof porch one evening when I see this girl that I've never seen before. I could tell that she clearly was not from around there. She was kind of a hippie looking girl and you really did not see that in a small town like this. She was walking down the sidewalk with her phone trying to get service. She turned and asked me if I knew of a good spot to get cell service. I told her it was hard because of the way the valley was and the only way I normally got service was by Wi-Fi calling through my internet provider. She kept walking and that was the last I had ever seen of her. A few minutes later, the neighbor that lived next door came over to me and asked if I knew who that girl was. I told her no and what happened with the girl asking about the cell phone service. My neighbor then proceeded to tell me that that girl was actually some kind of paranormal investigator from Texas. She and a couple of her friends were paid to come to this town every year by some neighbors a little further up the street. My neighbor began to tell me all these weird stories that came out of the house, and that apparently there was proof of it all. Doors opening and closing on their own, digital clocks changing from numbers to words, and even some recordings of people talking to spirits or ghosts apparently. Of course, I took this all with a grain of salt. I am always down for a good ghost story, but I'll be honest, I've never really fully believed in them. As far as I knew, the investigators stayed for a few days before they took off back to Texas. I never heard of them finding or discovering anything really. A couple of weeks went by and I forgot all about this. I was working the night shift at the time at a state prison not far from Indianapolis. I would come home every day at about 7am, take a shower and go right to bed. Suddenly, I started having very vivid dreams, paranormal types of dreams. Usually something was chasing me or attacking me, but I could never quite see them. I would eventually scare myself awake, sit up in bed until I calmed down for a little bit, and then I would go back to sleep until it was time to get back up and ready for work. This happened for a few weeks and I did not think anything of it other than just having some nightmares. Then the sleep paralysis started. I always had my phone sitting up and away, 
that I could just roll over and be able to see the time on the always-on display. I would begin having these same nightmares again, where something would either be chasing me or attacking me or something of the like, but I could not see what it was or where they were coming from. Then I would try to wake up, and I would open my eyes just enough that I was able to look at my phone, but other than that, I was unable to move. What really freaked me out, though, was that I could see something floating in the corner of my bedroom just above my phone. It did not have a face, but it would just sit there in the corner of the ceiling, looking down at me. I would eventually go back to sleep and wake up and get ready for work when my alarm went off. To be honest, I was kind of enjoying it in a weird way. I always described it to people as going through a haunted house. I am scared to death while it is happening. But after I wake up, I just kind of laugh it off and thought, man, that was wild. This was happening on an almost daily basis. Every day would be the same thing around the same time. Anywhere between 10 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. In 2018, I started a new job at a university and moved closer to my job. I got a new two-bedroom apartment and I've lived there ever since. I have never had these dreams or sleep paralysis since. Could any of that been related to the neighbors that lived up the street from me? Something Worse Than a Bear by Braxton Hi Swamp Dweller, my name is Braxton Pierce. I've sent you a few stories about some of my experiences at home here in Georgia. But what I'm about to tell you happened last summer when my wife and I went to Washington State for a week-long camping trip. We brought our camper with us to a reserved spot in Eatonville. It was amicable and warm during the whole week. Anyway, the first two nights were great as we cooked up some chicken and beans on our grill and roasted some marshmallows to make some s'mores for a little nighttime snack. The third night is when we had this crazy experience. A loud sound had woken me up a little after midnight, and then it woke my wife as our kids and babies soon were sound asleep. They can sleep through anything. Whatever we heard wasn't that far from our campsite, as it could have easily been about 10 to 15 yards away. It let out this strange whooping sound, and we could smell it. It smelled like hot garbage and roadkill combined. It was unbearable. Do you know how most campers have those dim yellow lights on outside? Well, we could see the lights from the inside window, and the smell got worse as this thing walked right in front of the yellow light of our camper. Now, my first thought was a bear, but bears don't typically stand on two feet for no good reason. All the food we ate we made sure to cover up and had all the leftovers because there were grizzly bears around. We even cleaned the grill so they won't smell the food from it. This creature had to be standing at around 7 or maybe even 8 feet tall, and we heard it make this low growling sound. Now, I've been around quite a few bears in my life and I've never heard them make a noise like this. So at this point, we're about 100% certain this was no bear. My wife and I were frozen solid, and I could see tears running down her cheeks. I whispered as silently as I could. Shh, try to be quiet. Out of nowhere, this thing suddenly makes a loud whooping sound again. This time it does it in groups of two, and it sounds much louder because it's right in front of the RV. Our camper even shook a little bit as it was walking around us. It had eventually left about 30 or so minutes later, and we could eventually go to sleep. The next day, we woke up at about 7 a.m. We stepped out of the camper and saw other people outside gathered around, looking at these absolutely massive footprints that the creature left behind in front of us. I asked them, Excuse me, we heard this thing last night. Did you guys hear it? Most everybody said they did. Look what it did right in front of your guys' camper. I looked at the set of footprints in total shock while everybody else was getting pictures of it. Everybody packed up and went home, even us. We even got our money back for the spot. 
I decided to inform the BFRO team to investigate the prints, and they got negative results, saying there weren't any known prints of the local wildlife, so it was likely 100% a Bigfoot. We personally decided to never go back there again, but the BFRO teams have been doing more investigations in that area, so hopefully we'll get more good hard evidence of these things. Thanks for sharing my story. Bigfoot in Alabama by Bradley G. Hello Swamp Dweller, I'm a big fan and have been listening for quite some time. Anyway, this is my encounter with what I believe to be a Bigfoot. A bit of background, I am a pretty avid outdoorsman. I grew up in the woods and always knew about Bigfoot but never thought I'd see one. So to set the scene, it was 2016, maybe 2017, around New Year's time. Also, my birthday and my family decided to take my best friend Lorenzo and myself to Alabama. I live in Texas, to visit some distant relatives for my birthday. We hung out with the family for a while and eventually gave up, and went to hang out in the woods like we always did. Anyway, Lorenzo, my cousin Tyler, and I explored the woods. While doing so, we came across an old abandoned mobile home. So we looked around and entered, Breaking typical teen stuff, we finished exploring the house and walked into the master bedroom, where we found a massive nest made from pine branches. We were in the mobile home for about 25 or 30 minutes when suddenly we heard this ungodly roar come from right outside. Then, the home started to rock back and forth violently, to the point it felt like it was going to tip over with us in it so we crawled out of a hole in the ceiling and started running. As we returned to the house, I turned my head, and I swear on everything I know that's true, I think I saw a Bigfoot. As I looked at this massive creature, it locked its eyes with me and it started chasing us back to the house. We even cut through three yards between my cousin's house and the woods and it stopped at the edge of the woods and watched us walk into the house. I wish I could say that was the end, but unfortunately, it's not. In the middle of the night, I awoke to my cousin and Lorenzo telling me to shh, it's right outside the window. So I go to peek through the blinds. And when I part them there, I was staring face to face with this thing and it looked angry to say the least. So we grabbed the guns and went outside where we saw it and there was nothing. So I take out an alternative cigarette and stare into the woods. We go to the abandoned mobile home about halfway in there, and I feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I slowly turned around, and there it is, only a couple of feet away. This thing again looks absolutely angry. So, being a bit inebriated now after my alternative cigarette, I do the only thing that I can assume to do. I run. I book it all the way back to the house with my friends as we're hooting and hollering the whole time absolutely scared out of our mind. And yes, we're loaded to the teeth with guns, but running was honestly probably the best option. Eventually, once we all made it to the house and calmed down and got our wits about ourselves, we decided that we would never talk about this again. We don't want to sound crazy. We don't want people to think that we're some crazy yahoos out there. But I know what I saw, and I know what we experienced. The Tickle Monster by Hauntingly Familiar 2 It all started when I was just a wee lass. Now, I've been dealing with ghost-related stuff for most of my life, but this is the strangest occurrence. Every night from the age of 4 to 7, maybe even 8, I would have chronic sleep paralysis. Anyone who has ever experienced sleep paralysis knows how frightening this can be. My experiences were just a little different. I would be visited by a creature that I named the Tickle Monster. It was always the same thing. The first thing that would happen would be a sign popping up where the bed meets the wall. It was generally written in blood. The sign would say, 
He's coming. He's here. Or something ominous. Then, the window or door would be open, and he would appear. I am trying to remember his exact appearance, however, I remember that he had long dreadlocks, a pale complexion, and long, bony fingers that were more like claws. He would approach my bed and proceed to quote-unquote tickle me. Being a child, I didn't know how to describe what he was doing, but that was the closest description I could come up with. This was not a joyful or fun experience, though. I wouldn't be able to move or scream, and once he finished tickling me, he would just leave. I would fully wake up and call my father or my mother, and this happened almost every single night, and the sequence of events would mostly stay the same. My mother would try to get me to communicate with the tickle monster as if he were real. This thing it had an ungodly mouth. Its mouth was full of razor-sharp, shark-looking teeth. She never doubted what I was experiencing was legitimate, but nothing really ever came of it. I don't know if she thought it was just something in my brain and it would go away after a while, or if it was a legitimate experience. One night, it just stopped and never happened again. I've only had two instances of sleep paralysis since that time, and neither of them had anything to do with the tickle monster. I've looked this up online to see if anybody else had this experience, but I'm not, I'm not having any help finding it. My manager told me of a voodoo demon who would steal children in the middle of the night or something like that, but I'm not sure it's an exact match. Part of me thinks that this was a product of an overactive imagination, but there's still a part of me that believes it could have been something more, maybe some sort of cryptid, paranormal entity, or some other otherworldly creature. The Blob Monster by Anonymous So it was around February of 2017. I was 15 years old and had a dry throat at the time. For that year, I wanted to build a shed in the middle of the woods of my backyard, mainly just to go hang out in as a fun project to do for the summer months. So on a cold, dry, windy, but sunny day, probably around noonish or late morning, I started the hike alone in the woods of my backyard to find the perfect spot to put down this shed. The shape and the geography of the property section with the woods are weird. The woods part of the property pokes out like the Oklahoma panhandle, and to get to the deepest woods of my property where I wanted to build the shed, you must walk up a hill and then that hill eventually plateaus. Also, that hill is easily the tallest in the general area. And on the day my encounter happened, I was to see hundreds if not thousands of feet, especially since there were no leaves on the trees. It's a two minute hike. You can see things like rusty barrels and metal fences in the woods, mainly because my backyard woods were a popular hunting spot back in the day. This is evident with the rusty metal barrels and beer cans I can find dating back to the 1980s. I hiked through the property and reached the plateau hill part. Also note that someone's house was probably a hundred feet from where I was. I had a pretty good view of the entire property, and there was also a barn in someone's house quite far from us where I could see way out in the distance. So for a few minutes I started looking for a good spot to put this shed. I eventually picked one and imagined how to build the shed. I wanted to start from scratch. While doing this I heard a five note whistle song type thing in the distance. Now, I'm no musician, but I will try to describe it. It was like two long, flat notes with a short break between two and then the next note. A higher pitch swinging note followed, then quickly an average swinging note, then back to a long, flat note with a higher pitch than the first two, and whoever was whistling kept repeating it and had lungs of steel. Now, I honestly looked around for quite a few minutes to see if I could find whoever was whistling. It sounded like it was coming from deeper into the woods, way downhill, but I didn't see anyone. I also checked the house and the barn to see if I could see anyone, and sure enough, there was not a living, breathing soul. I also thought that I didn't hear the rustling of leaves either. The whole woods were covered in them, and the rustling of leaves was loud and could easily give away your location. But there wasn't any rustling. I immediately ignored it, as probably one of my neighbors or something, also, please note that the whistling was not an animal, but a human. It had to be. 
Birds have chirp-like whistles, but this was a lot more breathy like a human. So I returned to my spot, content that it was a person probably just walking through the woods. That was the most logical conclusion. But the whistling kept getting closer and louder, still playing the same five notes. And still, I could not see a single person, heard no rustling of leaves or anything like that. I was very stubborn that it wasn't something paranormal and had to be a human. Even though whatever was whistling was coming towards me and I still had no clue who or what was whistling. The whistling was going on for over a couple of minutes now and eventually it sounded so close to me that it felt like somebody was literally on top of me. It sounded like the whistling was also coming from all directions at this point. So now I started to get a little bit spooked. I concluded that whatever this whistling was coming from had to be a threat. So I started returning to my house. It was only like a two or three minute hike. It's not like I was terribly far out like I said. I didn't run out of there or anything like that. I walked back as home as possibly calm as I could. I was spooked but not terrified or anything. I also felt like if I ran then whatever was whistling at me would pop out and chase me. So I walked and stayed calm to keep whatever it was at a stalking, taunting face. It sure did feel like whatever was whistling at me was stalking and taunting me. Now, I must be honest, this next part of my experience felt quite trance-like, so I could have just hallucinated this part and the whistling. I've had things like sleep paralysis episodes several times in my life, and when I'm exhausted, I do sometimes hallucinate stuff. But I wasn't tired at the time, nor had I had an hallucination episode for quite a long time. All of my tired hallucinations and sleep paralysis episodes last from a fraction of a second to several seconds. So if this were a hallucination, this would be the most crazy, in-depth, longest one I've ever had. So back to my story. I'm about a minute away from making it to my house's backyard, still hearing the whistling. I decided to look up and there it was. Something that was all gray, blurry, with no facial features. A humanoid looking thing. It was flying above me counterclockwise. It could have been about five to six feet in height with a wingspan around the same. The thing had the silhouette of a person with a head, two arms, torso, and legs. It looks like a T with a circle on top, acting like its head. It was almost like a blob. It almost had like no body definition. I trusted my gut and instead of running, I kept walking. Despite the threats, it kept me as safe for this long, I thought I'd keep doing it. Then finally, I took one step onto the grass in my backyard and suddenly everything weird stopped. There was no more whistling. The flying thing was gone, and that feeling of foreboding and being in a trance absolutely dissipated. I remembered smelling roses, though like it was peaceful. After that experience, I wanted to build something other than a shed in the woods. For years, even a little bit to this day, I hate being near that backyard alone. I took a long time to discuss this story because I honestly just ruled it as some sort of paranormal ghost encounter. The gray thing was possibly an angel or something like that. But after I looked on this thing called Cryptid Wiki and heard about the Kinderhook Blob Monster, there were kind of similarities to what I had experienced and I did notice that there were other things called blob sightings. First, I don't live crazy far from Kinderhook. I could easily take a drive over there in like 30 minutes. Two, I saw a blob-like creature that sounds exactly like that monster. So I'm not saying that's what it was, but I have a good idea that I met the blob monster. You have graciously shared some of my stories in the past, so I wanted to send you in another. My name is Evan, and I think I just had the weirdest encounter of my entire life. In one of my previous stories I mentioned me and my friend were heading to Ocean City, a popular beach in Maryland, about three hours from where I live. Well, I decided to go down again and spend some time at our condo, just relaxing and taking a load off. Summer has been very wacky due to the pandemic, so I did not plan on spending a lot of time down on the beach. I am one of those people who enjoy the beach vibes but do not like going down on the sand or getting in the water all that much. Well, 
Unless I am more alone and there are not loads of people clogging up the beach. Well, I drove down in my Chevy Nova on July 21st. It was just me this time, although my family was planning on joining me a couple of weeks later. So anyway, I sped all the way there, wanting to avoid stopping at all. When I pulled up, I hopped out shutting the Nova's door and running up to the condo. I unloaded all of my bags onto one of those hotel wheel carts that they sometimes have in elevators. Our condo has one for whatever reason, and it was much more efficient than running up and down the stairs carrying my bags. Well, once I got everything in the room, I stepped onto the balcony. We were on floor 5 of the complex, and it was a beachfront. I cannot tell you how nice it was to wake up to the sound of crashing waves every morning. Anyway, the ocean looks very choppy, but there are loads of people down on the beach, not caring for six foot of space at all. Well, that was not going to be me, I thought, as I headed back inside. It began to rain at around 2pm, and the beach was basically clear. I jumped on this opportunity and ran down, and surf fished for about an hour and a half, rain pouring down on me the entire time. I caught nothing, but when I fish, I feel alive. It is one of those things like bow hunting for me that just sends me to my happy place. So the first night passes and I order some seafood for dinner and go back to bed under freshly changed sheets. I wake up and make some coffee. I had brought down my Nintendo Switch, but I felt like I was being called to get off my butt and do something outdoors. That feeling won over and I decided what better way to spend a nice day at the beach than to go to Assateague Island. For those who don't know, Ocean City is basically a massive sandbar, and several islands and small specks of land are surrounding it. One such place is Assateague. It is a national park, and my next door neighbor who is studying to be a park ranger really got me into going to national parks. The great thing about Assateague is that it's basically multiple environments in one, let me briefly explain. The island has protected marshland as well as beaches. It is also a swampland and is rather big with forested sections. Basically, one massive natural playground for those who like being in the great outdoors. There are also horses that have been there for generations living on the island wild. They have a dune trail for off-road vehicles like Jeeps and certain type of pickup trucks. But since my Nova is from 1970, and sand basically equals rust on a classic car like that, it was a no-go. But I drove down and parked in one of the visitor lots. I hopped out and decided which way to go. I first hit the swamp trails and the mosquitoes destroyed me. Cursing at my stupid choice not to bring bug spray, I finished that trail. I then took the marsh path and waded in the beautiful marsh waters, seeing crabs and small fish dart by my legs. No, I know nothing scary has happened yet, and I'm sorry about that, but it will soon, I promise. Anyway, I find a good stretch of beach to lay out on. I did manage to remember to bring a towel, and so I laid out on the sand and closed my eyes. My bag and my Nova's keys were next to me, but I was not worried about this thievery. One, the park was basically empty, at least my part was anyway, and two, I'm 6'2" and I let my hair grow out to my shoulders. I look like a madman when I'm not properly groomed, but I would never hurt a fly. Anyway, I lost track of time. I probably got to the beach and laid down around 12. Well, my stupid self wakes up and it's already getting dark. I cursed my stupidity as I began to sit up. I screamed. I was sunburned so badly. I had put on sunblock, but I, I guess it had worn off. My body felt like it was flaming, and tears welled up in my eyes. I have had some horrendous injuries in my time, but sunburns are bad. If you have not ever had a bad one, imagine your skin bubbling and peeling away before your eyes, as you are as red as a dang tomato. Now, here is where the scary stuff begins. As I'm trying to figure out how to hobble back to my car, I hear a loud splash. Normally. I would not think much of anything about it. There are some exceptionally large fish and even sharks off the coast of Ocean City and Assateague. I even once caught a 9 foot sand tiger shark near Assateague two years prior, but that is beside the point. 
I realized that this splashing was maybe seven feet out. That was very odd. The chances of a big fish being that close to shore and making that much noise were slim, to say the least. I dropped my bag and my keys as I slowly and painfully got to my feet. It took maybe five steps to get to the water when it made a sound I would never forget. Picture the cries of a mountain lion mixed with the low calls of a large whale. It was scary, sad, and entrancing all in one. Extremely hard to explain, honestly. My mind immediately went to tales of sirens and mermaids, whose haunting calls would lure in unsuspecting sailors to their demise. I did not believe there were mermaids. I am not a skeptic by any means, but mermaids just seem so far out. We have only explored 2% of our oceans though, so honestly who knows what's out there. These thoughts and many more swirled around my brain as I backed farther and farther away from the crashing waves. The waves were much smaller now, and whatever made that noise was splashing my way. I began to hurry back and grab my bag. I sped out of there like a bat out of hell, back towards my car in safety. I spat profanities as I realized my keys to the Nova were back on the beach. I half hobbled, half sprinted to the spot I had just left, all the while feeling my skin peel and burn. I shone my phone light on the spot in the sand where I had just been. I saw them baseball slid scraping my knees and snatched the keys. As I went to get up, I met its gaze. It was the strangest thing I had ever seen. It was pale, almost translucent, like a jellyfish. Its skin looked aged but strong and muscular. Its legs were long and strangely tall like a basketball player, but there was not an inch of hair that I could see. The hands looked amphibious, and it had what almost resembled a tail. Its face was the real horror though. It looked like a clean mannequin face that you would see clothing being hung on in a department store. Except for a nose and a tiny slit which I assumed was its mouth. It was featureless. My heart was in my throat as I felt sweat pouring down my face. I, for whatever reason, smiled at it like a fool, maybe thinking this thing had some sort of emotions. It then smiled back, although it was all wrong. The tiny slit of a mouth began to expand, the face ripping and tearing apart to form an abnormally large grin. Blood trickled down this thing's face as it smiled back at me, with razor-sharp teeth glinting in my phone's flashlight. It is something that will haunt me to my dying day. I ran, screaming like a little girl. I was surprised no park ranger had heard my scream. As I ran back to my car yelling, I heard it scream back almost mocking me in a way. I got into my car and sped out of there. When I got to the condo, I ran upstairs as fast as I could. I locked the door behind me and began breathing erratically. When I composed myself, I sat down on the couch and basically passed out. The next day I went to the local clinic and got my burns checked out. They gave me a prescription lotion to help with the burns and I went home immediately. I looked everywhere for an explanation of what I saw. It cannot be a skimwalker because I am almost certain they do not go into the water and do not live in marshes like that. Could it be aliens? Maybe some other shapeshifted cryptid? I don't know. Thanks again Swamp Dweller for sharing my story and encounter. I really like your channel, it has kept me going through these rough times. If anybody in the comments has any idea what this thing could be, please let me know. I have always kept an open mind about the creatures that can roam our world. Partly because I'm inquisitive by nature, and partly because of my mother. She always taught us to be aware of our surroundings and respect nature. One of the first things she taught me was to listen to the animals. They will tell you if something is out there. One time, years ago when I was a teenager, we had traveled to my dad's hometown in Texas for a family reunion. His hometown is small. You can walk through the central part of the town in less than an hour. And everyone else lived in homes further out usually. They usually had about an acre or more of land around their homes, which was very nice and private. In the evening, 
we had joined my dad's large family at a hoedown near the edge of town. There were people dancing and drinking and having a good time, while me, my brother, and one of our cousins and her friend just hung out watching the festivities. We were talking about these teenager things that you'd always talk about, you know? Just who we liked or disliked at school, etc., you know? We looked out towards the edge of the party, where a fence bordered the location. We were at this separated area, where it separated the yard from the scrubland on the edge of town. We could not see far out since night had fallen, and the lights on the poles of the fence only illuminated the fence and the brush around it. As I looked out, I noticed something. An object that was half hidden by a small tree, but odd in that it was not swaying in the breeze like the rest of the foliage. I pointed it out to my brother and cousin, who spotted it as well. As we observed it, a few things became clear. It was a creature, about five feet tall if I had to guess. It was a tawny brown color, like a coyote. One of us asked if what it was was a coyote, but we could definitely tell it wasn't, it was just too big. We cautiously, or foolishly, made our way closer to the fence till we were only 20 yards away from it. This thing was a further 10 yards from the fence on its side, just far enough to be out of the range of the light. We stopped in our tracks as we could see enough to make out that this creature wasn't something we'd ever seen in our lives. It was a creature, covered in fur, hunched over on long legs, with human-like arms, long, gnarled hands ending in sharp claws. Its head was half hidden by the tree, but we could see a canine-like head with a long snout and pointed ears, just like a coyote. It was staring at us, and we were staring at it. We quickly ran back to the party, realizing that we were closer to this thing than we were to our own families. If this dog man, a term we didn't know at the time, was as fast as the werewolves we had seen in movies, the fence would have been no obstacle for this thing to get us if it felt so inclined. We were all shocked into silence. Once we were back at the hoedown, we just sat there and looked at each other. Did we just see that? Do creatures like that really exist? We were simply stunned at this encounter. We didn't even know who would believe us, so we just said nothing. The next day, my family was heading back to Oklahoma. My brother and I were secretly relieved considering what we had seen. But my cousin and her friend lived in Texas, in my dad's hometown, which was part of that thing's territory. I hope she never had to see it again. I quickly moved on from that night, but that encounter has always been in the back of my mind. As time went on, and I learned about creatures that people have seen in the woods, I heard at least a name put to what we had seen, and I hoped I'd never see anything like that again. But as they say, careful what you wish for. In 2019, I was out of my boss's farm for a three-day work excursion in the summer. His farm is about an hour away from Oklahoma City, and 80 acres of land that's mostly woods and pretty isolated his nearest neighbor is probably over a mile away. I have been to his farm many times over the years and was very familiar with the woods around his place. There was a trail that led into the woods from the compound, and I'd walk it every morning with his dog when I came to work there. I never walked to this trail alone, and never unarmed. Not because I was worried about Dogman or Bigfoot, but because wild boar was known to live in the area and they were the ones I was worried about. In all the years I had been up here, I had never heard about Bigfoot or Dogman being seen in the area, but plenty of boar. On this particular day, I set out towards the trail in the late afternoon, his dog Buddy right at my side. The trail was not exactly well traveled, and it was more grass than dirt. Halfway down the trail, where it was more open ground, I could already see a few deer tracks, some raccoons, even an armadillo scrape in the ground. As I was counting the different tracks, Buddy wandered off the trail into the trees to sniff at something that caught his attention or find a place to pee. I called out to him to not wander far, stepping towards the edge of the trail to do so. As I did, I looked down and saw something that made my heart stop. Right at the edge of the trail, 
right where the bare earth gave way to grass, was a large canine-like footprint. Bigger than any footprint Buddy could ever hope to make. As he was a 75-pound German Shepherd, and I have a 150-pound Great Dane at home, and even his paws aren't this big. I put my size 10 boot next to it, and the track was over half the size of my boot. It was decently fresh. No more than 24 hours old if I had to take an educated guess. I looked back from where the track led, but could not find any more tracks of this thing. It's like this thing jumped over the trail to avoid leaving prints in the dirt. Something jumped 15 feet across the trail to avoid leaving any trace of itself. I quickly looked around and strained my ears, but I could still hear the birds singing, insects chirping, and even Buddy was calm and relaxed. I called Buddy back to my side and set off down the trail to get back towards the barn. I did not want to stay any longer in case whatever made those footprints was still in the area. Further along the trail it became more surrounded by trees and leaves covered the trail. It's only because I have walked this trail so many times that I knew how not to get lost. But, as I navigated the trail, I noticed a large branch that was right on the edge of it. Branches were nothing new on the trail, of course, and with the ice storm that had occurred over the winter, many trees had lost a lot of branches. This one itself was 12 feet long and the size of my forearm at its thinnest, and larger than my thigh at its thickest. But what made me notice this one was that it had been turned over. I could tell by the imprint in the leaves and dirt. While hogs could and would turn logs over for food, hogs did not do this. There were no hog tracks or scrapes around it, and I was mentally traced back to the trail behind me where I had seen that footprint. I realized that this branch was right in the line with the footprint. And when I noticed that, everything had fallen silent. No birds, no bugs. I looked for Buddy but he was no longer at my side. He had continued up the trail and was now ten yards ahead of me, looking back at me with a nervous posture and seemed to say, we need to go now. I briefly looked around me but saw nothing in the woods, but I remember my mom telling me that old phrase, you may not see them, but they can see you. I put a hustle in my step and caught up with Buddy and we continued up the trail and all but ran to the barn since I cleared the tree line. I couldn't help but think in the back of my mind once I was back inside. They're here. They're here in Oklahoma. It's foolish to assume that they just wouldn't be here, you know? For some reason I thought they may just stay in Texas because of the range or whatever. Despite me only actually seeing one in Texas and only a track of one here. This week my brother had told me that his co-worker thinks he saw a dogman on the edge of his property recently. His co-worker lives in El Reno, Oklahoma. My boss's farm is only 10 miles from that town. St. Augustine is Haunted by Chance W. Around two and a half years ago, my wife and I met at church, culminating in our marriage on September 23rd, 2023. We reside in Jacksonville, Florida, and one of our frequent jaunts takes us to St. Augustine. However, a pivotal experience ties back to my teenage years in Mobile, Alabama, my hometown, where I will have to plan to return eventually. The catalyst for this tale emerged during a family visit from Mobile. Eager to explore, my mom secured St. Augustine ghost tour tickets. It was a novel experience for most of us, delving into the historical significance of the oldest city in the US. My dad, mom, sister, cousin, and aunt accompanied me. We opted for the 11pm tour due to the delayed ticket arrangements extended past midnight. My interest in the paranormal led me to snap pictures throughout the tour. Initially my scrutiny revealed nothing unusual, hurrying to capture more while the group forged ahead. Things took an eerie turn at the graveyard, purportedly housing Spanish and French remains from historical conflicts. Upon reviewing the photos at a later stop, there was a 1500s era house nestled in this nice set of woods. I decided to go explore around, 
This is where a chilling revelation emerged. One picture exhibited three ghostly figures, a spectral man seated in a centuries-old chair, an inexplicable apparition that perplexed me momentarily. I almost forgot that I was in this old dilapidated house in the woods. The subsequent image depicted a creepy woman feeding a toddler-like figure, discernible by the bow in the hair. Despite the unsettling nature, it paled in comparison to what followed. As I approached the next stop in this cabin, about to step back outside into the woods, encountering a wax figure of what I can only describe as Jack Sparrow, an unsettling incident began to unfold. In a narrow hallway, I distinctly heard children's laughter, as clear as a scene from a movie. Absolutely astonished, I turned and ran back to my family, leaving that little nook of woods, convinced they had all heard it. But to my bewilderment, they claimed no knowledge of such laughter despite me not even being that terribly far. The journey back home allowed me to review the pictures more closely. One striking image depicted nine ghostly figures congregating in the graveyard. At the same time, another showcased an eerie figure resembling an undertaker, a stark, ominous presence with long hair, a dark coat, and a weathered western hat. This inexplicable experience still lingers in my memory, leaving a haunting curiosity that has left me fueled to explore more areas. The Forest Edge by Kawa Stories echo through the generations in the remote corners of northern Canada, where the vast wilderness meets the border with the United States. Tales of skimwalkers, ghostly apparitions, and cryptids linger in the air, passed down from elders to the curious youth. I've had my share of inexplicable encounters with the supernatural, which have left an indelible mark on my understanding of the world. Yet, one night in particular, a chilling evening in October of 2010, stands out among the rest. Our small Canadian community is shrouded and surrounded by woods, threaded by narrow trails navigatable only by ATVs or the adventurous souls on foot. It was a place where the veil between the seen and unseen felt thinner than anywhere else. And it was on the night that my friends, Oaks and Day, and I decided to tread the road notorious for its dark history. Snaking through the wilderness for three eerie miles, the road lacked the comfort of a single street lamp. Legends swirled around it, whisperings of hitchhiking ghosts, the haunting hoof lady, and the elusive Sasquatch. As darkness cloaked the landscape and the clock struck 8pm, we impulsively decided to traverse this haunting stretch of land. Our supplies were minimal a solitary flashlight, coats to ward off the chilling air, and our own company, I guess. Oaks and Day were fervent in their anticipation, recounting tales of spectral encounters from their family lore. But for me, a sense of dread loomed over this escapade. Stories of disappearances and inexplicable phenomena had instilled a deep-seated fear of the unknown. As we approached the forest edge, the road lay ahead, faintly illuminated by passing vehicles. The sight provided a sliver of reassurance amidst the encroaching darkness. Day held the flashlight, its beam withheld for reasons unknown, while my friend's boisterous chatter sought to mask the unsettling silence. Minutes dragged like hours, each step amplifying the quiet unease that had settled within me and about halfway along the road stood an abandoned farmstead, a decrepit relic of the past. Oaks, fueled by curiosity, proposed exploring its crumbling interiors. Instinctively, I opposed to the idea, urging a swift return home. Yet as we drew closer to the derelict farmhouse, Day's sudden gasp shattered the night's tranquility. She claimed to have seen a flickering light inside the lonely structure, 
Dismissing it as a prank, Oaks laughed, playfully chiding her. But a creeping sense of disquiet gripped us as we witnessed a faint glow within the supposedly deserted homestead. It's impossible, Day whispered, her voice tinged with disbelief. I too recoiled in horror, my mind racing through a spectrum of possibilities. Was it an apparition, an evil force, or something beyond comprehension? I demanded Day to illuminate the area with the flashlight, yet she hesitated. Fed up with the eerie charade, I voiced my urgency to leave. Peering toward the farmhouse, Oaks confirmed this was impossible. There was a glimmer of light. Without a second thought, I turned on my heels, marching briskly back towards home. Day and Oaks stumbled to catch up as my pace quickened. My mind raced with frantic thoughts, regretting not bringing my four-wheeler or a cell phone for emergency contact. The flickering light in the farmhouse haunted my imagination, conjuring sinister possibilities. Was it a spectral entity, an evil presence, or perhaps something more extraterrestrial? The pounding of our footsteps reverberated through the night until abruptly I realized the eerie absence of my friend's hurried steps behind me. A gnawing sense of dread compelled me to glance back. To my horror, Oaks had fallen, sprawled on the ground while Day's panicked cry pierced the night. Her terrified shriek drew me toward the farmhouse, now engulfed in an inexplicable phenomenon. A ball of fire, akin to a dancing flame, emerged within the decrepit structure seemingly pulsating with an unearthly energy. It ascended, paroded, and perched atop the farmhouse, casting an otherworldly glow upon the night. It felt sentient as if its fiery gaze fixated on our fleeing figures. Propelled by sheer terror, Oaks bolted upright and sprinted, urging us to follow suit. We plunged into the woods, the haunting light of the fiery apparition still visible a surreal and terrifying spectacle that defied rational explanation. The relentless pursuit continued as we fled the winding trails, the luminous enigma of the fireball remaining tethered to the abandoned house. Panic-stricken and breathless, we sought refuge at Oak's grandparents' house. Desperation etched on our faces as we recounted the surreal encounter. Their elderly voices carried wisdom steeped in folklore soothing our frayed nerves with the tales of fireballs. A harbinger, a spectral messenger rather than an evil omen. The reassurance and stories attempted to quell our fear before we departed for our respective homes. The lingering enigma of the fiery apparition still haunting our thoughts. Days passed, but the memory of the unearthly spectacle lingered. The cryptic words of Oak's grandparents reverberated resonating with an inexplicable profundity. It wasn't until the untimely passing of an elder in our community, just three days after our chilling encounter, that the pieces began to fall into place. The farmhouse, long abandoned by its owners, had once been the home of a grandfather who had departed from this realm. The fiery apparition we had encountered bore a message, a warning veiled in the dance of flames and otherworldly communication preceding the Elder's passing. Though inexplicable and haunting, the spectral encounter left me pondering the mysteries of our world, reminding me that beyond the veil of the known lies a realm of enigmas, where the supernatural and the ordinary intersect in inexplicable ways. An Encounter with Eyes by Brian G. Living on our 17-acre property in the Pacific Northwest, my wife and I resided in a camping trailer about a hundred yards away from the main house owned by my mother-in-law. The land, once a site for logging a century ago, hides numerous untold stories and mysteries of generations past. One such story I've uncovered involves the early inhabitants, Mr. John Graham Sr. and Mrs. Mona Smith. Their son John Graham Jr., an architect, left his mark on Seattle, designing iconic structures like the Space Needle. The lake nearby was named Lake Money Smith in honor of John Sr.'s wife. In this wooded haven, home to our ducks, chickens, sheeps, and goats, the wilderness teems with life. 
Bald eagles soar, black bears roam, deer and their young find refuge. While possums, raccoons, and bobcats call this place home, there was even a sighting of a cougar about five miles away. But one night, an encounter shook me to my core. It was a moonless night, and I found myself outside the trailer wearing a headlamp, tending to the mundane task of emptying the back water tank. The beam of my headlamp barely penetrated the surrounding darkness, illuminating only what was directly in front of me. Standing there, waiting for the tank to empty, I saw two reflective orbs staring back at me from the impenetrable void of the woods. On this land I've encountered and startled bears, been surprised by them, named the deer, been dive-bombed by bats, and even sprinted after a bobcat eyeing our ducks. But these eyes, they were different. Tall enough to be a bear, yet not spaced apart like a deer's. My attempts to scare it off with shouts, mock charges, and furious yells proved to be futile. It stood unwavering, unblinking, motionless. The unnerving silence hung heavy as those eyes pierced through the darkness, fixated on me. For an eternity, I waged a one-sided battle against this unseen entity, its unwavering gaze chilling me to the bone. I mustered all my courage, bellowing and stamping my feet, but those eyes, unmoving, remained fixated on me. A sense of foreboding crept in. I realized this wasn't like anything I had encountered before. The eyes, glowing and intense, never wavered. They were there, stubborn and unyielding, until suddenly they turned away. They vanished into the darkness without a sound, rustle, or twig break, leaving me with a chilling void of confusion. It's been a decade since that haunting encounter, and still the mystery lingers. Despite the passing years, the night's events remain etched vividly in my memory. I've often contemplated the inexplicable nature of that presence, the enigmatic pair of eyes that seem to defy the natural world, leaving me an eerie sense of wonder and curiosity that endures to this day. And yet every time I venture out to tend to the back water tank, a lingering thought nags at me. What else might be lurking in those silent woods? Hey Swamp, my friends call me Ray, but I'm changing the names of everyone else involved. We lived in Texas until last year when we moved to Alaska. There isn't much I can say about my job without giving away the company, but my time is spent outdoors. Two years ago, my wife Haley was involved in an accident and we fell on some hard times. We also have two kids so it seemed like we were being offered an opportunity to get back on track. I could hardly say no. While we didn't expect to love it out here, we thought it would be bearable long enough to pay off some debt, but no research could have prepared us for this place. It took over a year for my wife to physically recover from the car crash. She still has PTSD, working from home and not traveling on interstates fit into our new lifestyle nicely though there are plenty of downsides. The fact that an ocean now separates us from the rest of our family bothers me the most. The kids didn't want to leave their friends, but luckily they haven't hit their teen years yet, or the resistance would have been much worse. Jason is only 10 and Jenny is 7. Surprisingly, they've adjusted better than we could have ever dreamed. The strange day and night cycles aren't split into six month cycles as we had always heard. There are a couple of occasions where it's one or the other, but it's mostly just long summer days and winter nights. The kids were happy to discover what a novelty it all was to everyone back home. During the first two weeks, they practically lived on FaceTime. It made us feel like everything would be okay, which was a big deal considering how poorly Haley and I were coping. The overall stress was unbelievable. Moving to a new city is a significant undertaking, but this was a different league entirely. We failed to appreciate that Alaska is very cold. Obviously, we knew it was something to prepare for in terms of buying the necessary supplies. But those who have never experienced a proper winter can't grasp how drastically it changes your daily life. We couldn't afford four entirely new wardrobes on top of new tires and the countless other items we didn't consider. Thankfully, our families were able to help. I don't know what we would have done without them, to be honest. 
Our house is far more excellent than we had in Texas, which was another plus for the kids, if not slightly ironic. Usually it's more expensive to live in the city than in the country, but that's not true here. Thanks to my company, we got a great deal on our house, but everything else is nearly double the price. We came very close to selling our cars, rather than have to pay for them to be brought over, but thank goodness we didn't. Had we understood my drastically higher salary was to cover basic living expenses, I'm not sure we would have moved. And our only neighbor, Odette, lives across the road. She and her husband bought their home over 40 years ago, but sadly he passed away last spring. She doesn't get out often, but she's very kind. The day we moved in, she came over with a delicious casserole. There's nothing like a free meal after a long, hard day. Especially that day involved your first glimpse at the grocery store's outrageous pricing. Odette accepted our invitation to stay for dinner. She may be in her late 60s, but she can keep up with the best of us. She has a thousand stories. The kids would have listened all night if we let them. Once they were finally in bed, the rest of us had our coffee in the den. That's when Odette's story started to get... a little weird. The light-hearted tone in her voice suddenly turned very grave and her gaze dropped to the floor. When you bought this house, did Alan tell you about any of the local legends we have around here? Her words ran together as she blurted them out. Um, nope, none that I can remember. I was confident because there had been almost no contact with the actual owner. I looked to Haley for confirmation, and she was also shaking her head. The drastic change in our neighbor's demeanor made us feel like she was about to deliver some terrible news. Like something along the lines of the previous owner slaughtered his whole family or was some sort of serial killer or something like that. Something dangerous. I had a feeling. She sipped her coffee and took a deep breath before continuing. Did you know Alaska has its very own Bermuda Triangle? We had certainly not heard about this, but she told us all about it. Something like five out of every thousand people go missing around here, and most happen in the area we are in. I was surprised, but not necessarily frightened. Many states are uninhabited. It wasn't a stretch to assume people might go out, lose their way, and succumb to the wildlife, or the elements. It was like Odette could hear the thought forming. That's when she explained the Kustaka legends. Kustaka are ottermen. I remember hearing a few Bigfoot stories in the past, but nothing we dreamed that could be real. Even as we listened to her describe the eight-foot-tall shape-shifting creature, I couldn't create a severe mental image of a giant, man-like otter walking around on two legs, at least not maliciously. Our neighbor described how they would sometimes take the appearance of a loved one to lure their victims into the woods. There's no shortage of people willing to give first-hand accounts of their own experiences, though witness testimony doesn't mean much to me personally. It seemed like the Kustaka were Alaska's version of cow tipping. Just because something is impossible doesn't stop everyone and their brother from saying it happened. Even though these creatures usually lure victims to their doom, Odette claimed they sometimes appear in human form to approach those who are lost or injured. They pretend to offer the victim aid, but they intend to lead them deeper into the forest, where they will turn the human into one of their own. I'm still unclear about what the process entails but I didn't try to learn. Even now, it's difficult for me to wrap my head around this. When I asked Odette why she was telling us these things, she said it was because of her son Cam, who hired a Kentucky boy to work on his crew several years ago. They warned Kyle of the various dangers from day one, but he thought they were hazing the newbie. When his aggravation began affecting his job, performance, Odette invited the whole crew to a barbecue in hopes that the boy would take her words more seriously. Unfortunately, he chose not to attend. Then, at roughly 3 p.m. the following Tuesday, Kyle signaled a bathroom break to his supervisor and stepped away. He was never seen again. No one expected him to vanish in the middle of a shift, but concerns proliferated when 20 minutes passed without his return. Initially, they hoped he was only trying to scare them for revenge. Cam and three others searched for him while the rest continued working. Formal searches were conducted over the following weeks, but there was no trace. There's nothing Odette could have done, but she feels deep remorse for his loss. Our hearts ached for the poor woman. Haley and I found ourselves believing in the Kustaka to ease her mind. But we began discussing it after she left. 
As someone who wasn't raised with Otterman lore, it was tough to take seriously. So what did we do? We turned to YouTube and discovered Alaska is known for many creepy cryptids, and Kustaka stories are among them. The History Channel has a great show called Missing in Alaska, and episode 10 has what we were looking for. It told of a writer who came down to research the legend for a book, but he vanished too. That's insane. I won't go through the whole video, but while it was enjoyable, it didn't convince us otter men existed. We believed that the locals truly believed in them, which was good enough. We decided to humor the legend as a show of respect. Honestly, it encouraged safer practices in the wilderness, which can only be a good thing. Overall, our strategy worked well. Though I was admittedly nervous starting the new job when I learned some of our work would take us through the triangle. My co-workers stories didn't help either, but things got more accessible after the first month passed without incident. The days began to bleed together as life moved on in a beautifully mundane blur. And eventually, I forgot about the legends completely, until late February. The job should have been simple. Find the spot on the land, dig, and get home before something gets frostbite. It was the same routine like any other day except for Jason's birthday. He was disappointed I had to work and didn't want to open his presents without me. We FaceTimed long enough for him to rip open some paper, but the signal dropped. Luckily, Haley had the foresight to give him the iPad first, and I felt less guilty about his decision to wait for the rest. I worked like a machine. I didn't even stop for lunch. My mind was focused on getting the job done and making it home. That evening, in the gray light of dusk, we packed up and made the short hike back to our trucks. It had been a long day, and no one lingered around to chat, and I didn't blame them. I was five to ten minutes down the road when I realized my phone was still at the site. When talking to Jason, I had propped it up on a tree and forgot to grab it when my hands were free again. If it had been anything else, I would have left it for the next day, but not my phone. No thoughts of danger entered my mind, but why would it? I was returning to a place I knew well, and it would only take a moment to walk in, get my phone, and get back on the road. I drove as close to the site as safely as possible and found myself running the rest of the way. I still don't understand why I felt so rushed. There was no doubt Jason had been thoroughly engrossed in his new tablet all day. His other presents weren't going anywhere. Yet I was running through the wilderness like a fool. It was almost completely dark when I reached for my phone. I hadn't thought to grab a light, so I'm not sure what I would have done if it had gotten dark first. As I stood trying to turn on the phone's flashlight, I heard what sounded like a fox crying out. A friend had recently found one trapped in an old hunter's snare. And I wouldn't say that I liked the thought of leaving it if the same thing happened again. I rushed off with my light pointed at the ground ahead. I was nervous about leaving the trail, but the cry sounded very close. I continued straight for a few yards, maybe 20 or so, without seeing any sign of the fox. No matter how far I walked, it seemed like it would be past the next shrub. I must have walked 50 to 60 yards when the noise was immediately cut off, like someone pressed stop on a tape recorder and it suddenly began to snow heavily. The weather here is unpredictable, but that instance was strange, even by Alaskan standards. The howling wind was the only sound in the forest, and I had to move quickly. It doesn't take long for flurries to become full-on snowstorms here, and I didn't want to think about what would happen. As the snowfall increased, I turned back the way I came, and the light began reflecting into my eyes. The temperature dropped rapidly, and my truck was the only shelter for miles. I opened the phone's compass to ensure I maintained a straight line, but no matter which direction I pointed, it wouldn't spin. Hoping to use the GPS, I hunched down against a tree and turned off the light while trying to open Google Maps, but there was no signal, not even to send a text. To make matters even worse, I only had 48% battery remaining, and solid white snow walls were now surrounding me. It's a miracle I didn't lay down to die on that spot. If I weren't a father, things would have gone differently. I don't know. Forcing myself to leave the tree's illusion of safety was extremely difficult. I was practically crawling when I continued from my desperate search for the path. The wind tore into me from the right. My beanie doubled as my face mask, and thankfully, I developed a habit of putting my gloves in a coat pocket, or they'd be in the truck with my boots and earmuffs. The body loses the most heat through its ears and feet. The added layer of my coat's thick hood helped protect my head. 
but I feared the worst for my numb toes. No expense is spared regarding the boots we wear out here. They are knee-high, insulated, and clunky. Perfect for the job, but awful for the roads. Like most of the guys, I changed into something lighter at the end of the day, and that's why I was wearing a pair of regular Red Wings. Even though my feet were too cold to feel, I knew each step forward was filling my boots with more snow as their rims dipped beneath the surface. If nothing else, the sheer weight increase was enough to be sure. My mind was overrun with daydreams of life on disability after losing my feet. I would become an alcoholic, Haley would leave me, the kids would hate me, and I would move in with my parents. It was as clear as the air was white as I realized my hands were also going numb from clawing myself forward against the worst gusts of wind. I would have cried, but I'm sure my tear ducts were frozen shut. My snowballs were lodged somewhere between my lungs, but I'm trying to keep this PG, if you will. I was on the verge of digging a hole behind the next tree I stumbled into when I froze in place at the sound of a familiar voice calling my name. It was faint over the storm. I thought I imagined it at first, but then I heard it again, slightly louder. It, it was my boss, Brian. I screamed so loud that my raw throat felt like it was cracking open, but I wasn't going to waste my chance at survival. My heart swelled with overwhelming relief when he answered my cries and I pulled myself upright while impatiently waiting for rescue. The wind calmed slightly, allowing for me to hear his footsteps. The sound was beautiful and terrifying. He was approaching from my left, meaning I had to be going the wrong way. My sense of relief was tainted with horror as my brain entered several what-ifs in the next short seconds it took for Brian to come into view. A fierce gust of wind stopped him roughly 30 feet away and he shouted, Follow me! before turning to lead us back. The thought of reaching my truck, mostly the heater, pushed me away from the flood of worst-case scenarios. There would be plenty of nightmares and therapy bills for those later. Staying low... I hurried forward to close the gap between myself and Brian, but he was also picking up speed. That was fine with me, the faster we got out, the better, but I was so focused on trying to catch up that I failed to notice we still hadn't reached the path. Even worse, I was moving at a dangerous speed with only a dim light pointed ahead of my feet. Any misstep could have easily twisted or broken my ankle. Eventually, common sense took over my mindless panic. Brian, wait! I shouted as loudly as my raw throat would allow, but he didn't seem to hear me. I tried again and again as we continued to speed through denser foliage. My feet were getting tangled in vines, thorny branches were tearing my coat, and I knew something was wrong. I should have known much sooner. Finally, I stopped dead in my tracks, turned around and resumed moving as fast as I dared, fully aware I would not survive a fall. My encounter with... The figure, I called Brian, played through my mind in a split-screen fashion alongside Odette's warnings of Kustaka, taking on the appearance of friends to lure victims more plunging into the forest. The only thing capable of pulling me from those thoughts was the horrifying sound of Brian's voice calling out, What are you doing? That's the wrong way! I know it's always a mistake to look back, but that's precisely what I did. At first glance, I saw an enormous black shape dart past a tree and vanish from sight. My heart skipped at least three beats before I could force myself to move again. The shape I saw was a minimum of eight feet high, and there was a dark undertone in the voice that yelled, Come back! We're trying to help you! It sounded so close when it spoke that I stumbled and couldn't help casting a glance to my right. I didn't think it was possible to feel even more frightened than I was, but the image of a giant, hairy, disfigured face seared into my mind as I struggled to regain footing. It was poking its enormous head from behind a tree. I could still see it now, clear as day, burned into my mind, and there is little hope to ever forget that thing in the future. I'm not sure how long I ran, but it felt like an eternity. All I can say for sure is that I kept putting one foot in front of the other, and eventually I had several voices calling my name from multiple directions in the distance. To say I was skeptical would be a vast understatement, but I didn't know what to do. Every move felt fatal. What if they are all Kustaka, or one of the several other cryptids I've heard about? What if they're real people, but I ran away? What if the first monster catches up while I'm standing here? Hoping it was a reasonable thing to assume monsters wouldn't have flashlights, I decided to shout a tentative cry for help and run towards the first light I saw. 
Unfortunately, that cry turned into the high-pitched squeal of a teenage girl when a branch snapped directly behind me. In complete darkness, I surged forward, unsure if the snag at the bottom of my coat was real or imagined, and a dozen shots rang out in reply. In seconds, spotlights were pointed in my direction and the sound of weapons being prepared to fire was sweet music to my ears. I screamed, It's behind me! several times before collapsing, but I didn't need to say more. Everyone understood my meaning perfectly. I was later told that Kustaka probably left when it heard all the other people. As I thought, Haley called Brian when I didn't come home, and he took care of the rest. They all raced back to search for me. Apparently there's no point in wasting time with police in those weather conditions, and I'm grateful they didn't. There's no doubt I was close to the end. After I collapsed, they zipped me into a sleeping bag Tommy had the foresight to bring from his truck and carried me out of there like in a body bag. I wasn't too far off in the direction I was traveling, but I wouldn't have found the trail. Even without the possible Kustaka encounter or psychotic break, whichever you believe, there's no doubt that I would have died out there if they hadn't found me. I had to spend a little time in the hospital because of the frostbite. It's a complicated healing process, but miraculously, I've gotten to keep all of my fingers and toes. I'm primarily okay now, but my sense of touch isn't quite what it used to be in the worst places. No circumstance will ever get me to step foot into the wilderness alone again. In our original budget, we planned to live here for four to five years, which increased with the unexpected living cost. I'm not so sure if I can last that long, though. Haley and I have decided to call our families tomorrow to discuss possible options. If we could find jobs beforehand and arrange a place to stay while we look for a new house, it may be possible to leave sooner. We don't plan to tell them about the triangle. They would be deeply concerned for our mental health. We're heartbroken, and I regularly work near dangerous wildlife. Those are facts. I'm sure there are more, but those are enough. I'm ashamed of how stupid it was to put myself in that situation, which must have been evident to the others. I can guarantee every person in our tiny town heard what happened that day, but no one has questioned me about it. I don't think I could say all of this if they did, not face to face, and I'm sure they know that too, but writing it out like this, I don't know, I do feel a little better. Well, that's all I have to say besides thanks for doing what you do. Even if you don't use this for your channel, I appreciate that you took the time to read it. If I weren't trying to move away from this frozen wasteland, I would be supporting you with more than likes and shares. Keep up the great work, and best wishes to you and your family, Swamp Dweller. Stalked in an Ohio State Park by Queasy Comfort I work as a childcare professional, and one of the kids recently got into hiking, so I took him to an excellent Salt Fork State Park trail that I like. We were all set to hike to Hosack's Cave after parking near the trailhead's beginning. The entire course is about a half mile long, so I chose this trail for our daily hike. I also decided this trail because any time I had been on it before, it was hectic and full of people and a trendy spot which made me feel a bit more secure. However, this past summer we had a cluster of severe summer storms that caused massive damage to the trail so to my surprise, it was much more complex and empty. However, I wasn't bothered by the open path because a small construction crew was working on a bridge that was just barely visible from the trailhead. He was still up for the hike, despite the entire width of the trail being washed out until it was no more than a foot wide, with a 6 foot to 12 foot drop into a creek bed with a solid rock and several trees that had fallen down. He is very athletic and I was confident in his abilities if he was. Confident that he could do so, I thought that he could. And he seemed to be very excited to tackle our adventure, so who was I to say no? We made it to a platform that allows you to see the entire cave. There were many downed trees surrounding the platform and it was closed at this point, but we had made it this far so we decided to maneuver around the venue and proceeded the few hundred feet into the cave. We spent most of the time in this area due to the difficulty it was to get there, so I know exactly what it looked like. There were tree roots directly under the platform, and you could climb down either side. It is also worth noting that Hosack's cave is much more like a cliff with an overhanging rock formation and a trickle of a waterfall directly in the middle. It's not a creepy closed up cave. It's very open and beautiful. 
We got to the cave and I noticed a candle that was not burning recently but had been sitting on a large rock with a heart carved into it. I chalked it up to someone having a date and disregarded it. He wanted to climb to the top where I noticed two more candles and three stacks of small rocks that somebody had stacked up. I felt weird at this point, but it was about this time that he found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. This was the happiest I had seen the kid in a long time, and I didn't have the heart to tell him it was time to go. We spent about an hour catching baby salamanders, and I watched him have the time of his life. We finally decided to leave, and when we got to the platform, dead center in the middle of the tree roots was a wet washcloth hanging that was not there before. He noticed it as well, but did not pick up on the severity of the situation that we were apparently in. At that moment, I factually knew two things. One, someone was watching us, and we did not see them. And two, they were now potentially hiding in the woods and made it a point not to be seen, but leave an object to be noticed. There was no running back with the narrow trail, and I was not about to tell him that we were in potential danger. I told him to go in front of me and I kept encouraging him that he was doing great over and over, which seemed to speed him up naturally. I never saw anyone while we were on the trail, but I had the most intense feeling of being watched the entire hike back. We got to the car and I locked the doors immediately. On our way out of the park, a filthy man, probably in his 30s, came out of the woods and made a point to stare at me with the blankest expression I had ever seen on a human being. The man followed me with his eyes and head as I drove by him and continued to stare at him until I couldn't see him anymore. At that point, I knew the third fact. He made it a point to make himself appear to me, and facts one and two were confirmed. That stare stuck with me for days and I considered counseling after this as it bothered me for several weeks, causing me severe anxiety. I tried to tell myself that maybe we just interrupted his bath time and he was camping and didn't want to startle us. After all, the crazy looking man had ample time to do anything he wanted while we were catching salamanders. I cannot rationalize why he stared into my eyes the way he did. If he wanted to be unnoticed, why would he have made himself so, uh, obvious? Deep down, I know it was much likelier that this was a deliberate action intended to scare me. He never had any idea how panicked I was, and to this day, it is the most fun I had ever seen that kid have. He brings it up regularly, and it's a positive experience for him. But on the other hand, it was one of my worst experiences and made me feel sick and disturbed.